friends and welcome back. Today I'm going to teach you all about gouache painting and the basic fundamentals of this great medium. And while we're at it, I'm also going to teach you how to paint five basic flowers to get you started on your gouache journey. I want this to be fun and relaxing and zero stress. So if you're interested in coming along for this paint along with me, keep watching. So let's get started. What is gouache? Basically, gouache is a water-based paint, which unlike watercolors, is opaque. In a nutshell, the difference between watercolor and gouache is that gouache is an opaque version of watercolors. When you paint with watercolor, the white of the paper and any layers of paint underneath will show through. Whereas after you paint a layer with gouache, the paper underneath or the layer underneath won't show through as much. So that changes how you work with it. Uh, can you use gouache as watercolors? Sure, but um, today we're going to be using gouache the way it was intended to be used, which is by using very opaque layers, not a lot of water, and um, building up layer by layer in a way that I think is very different from how you work with watercolors. Let's go through our supplies first. We're going to need a pad of paper, so I have my Strathmore Bristol 300 series paper right here. And then we're going to need a pencil, and of course your gouache paints. And for this demonstration I'll be using colors that are available in most beginner gouache sets, so primary reds and yellows, uh, yellow ochre which is available in most standard sets, a burnt umber, I used up all of my primary blue so I'm going to be substituting it with this Prussian blue instead. And then arguably the most important paint for gouache is white. And I recommend either titanium white, permanent white, or primary white. Um, do not go with a zinc white because you won't get the desired outcome for this project. I have my green here, which is a Windsor green, and an ivory black. And that's it for the paints. We'll also need something to mix them on. So I'm just using this glass plate that I have. So any standard palettes or ceramic surfaces will work just fine. In terms of the brushes, I'm going to be using a number one synthetic brush from Princeton. And I also have a number six, you can also use a number four, but I have a number six Escoda brush. Before we start painting, please take a minute to hit the subscribe button. It's something small you can do to help support this channel and really, really helps me with being able to create more amazing content for you guys. Let's create a poppy first. And we're gonna create the stem of this flower by creating a simple S curve. So essentially just an extended letter S. And at the top of that letter S, I'm gonna put a little dot, which will just indicate where the center of my flower is. And then I'm gonna create basically a blob shape. So I wish I had a better description for this, but I'm just gonna call it a blob. It's a circular shape with some irregularities on the edges. And then a second curve, which is a C curve that will intersect the first stem that we created. And at the top of that second stem, I'm gonna create an almond-like shape, which is gonna be for a budding flower. To the right of those two, I'm gonna create another C curve for a leaf. And then to the left, I'm gonna have a little, um, very short little C curve as well for another leaf that's sticking out to the left. Now this is gonna be the extent of my drawing with a pencil because when you start to paint the center of this flower, any details that you might draw will be completely covered up by the gouache paints. So let's start to mix our paints. And this is kind of the exciting part because you feel like you're really painting now. So I'm gonna squeeze out some of my red onto my palette, a little bit of white since I know I'm going to need that. And I'm also going to add some green, which I will mix with a little bit of blue for this first flower. Now, before we start actually painting on our first flower, let's take a look at how to handle gouache as a medium. If you've ever worked with watercolors, you'll know that you usually add a lot of water to your paint before you put it onto your paper. However, with gouache, your ratio of paint to water is very different. You don't usually want to put too much water and you want the paint to have kind of a creamy consistency. So not watery and not too thick or buttery either. So you're using a lot less water and the paint is coming onto your paper a lot thicker and a lot more opaque. To clean your brush as a general practice, I don't usually recommend cleaning your brush straight into your water container. Unlike watercolor, with gouache you're using a lot more paint, so it can quickly become a muddy mess in your water container. What I recommend doing is getting some paper towels and wiping off your excess paint on that first before cleaning your brush. And that'll ensure that your water doesn't become too muddy too quickly and that you don't have to replace it too often. 
I usually wipe it off once, rinse it, and then wipe it again. Let's paint the stem of the first flower. So I'm going to mix some green and some blue together. I'm gonna to get a little bit of water, um, very small amount, and mix my green and my blue together. I also like to add white to most of my colors when I mix them because the white gives me a better consistency for the gouache and it adds to the opacity of the color. So I typically will add a little bit of white to every color that I mix. I loaded up my brush and I'm going to paint the stem of this flower using my number two brush from Princeton. And I'm gonna to try to create as smooth of a line as possible. Um, obviously it's not gonna be perfect and nothing in art ever is. So don't stress about it. And if it's not perfect, don't worry about that either because most people won't be able to see any irregularities once you've painted everything. I now have my three stems, so I'm going to add some details to a leaf, which will be on the stem to the right. And I'm going to do this by adding little notches, um, one after the other, starting with the left-hand side, and then I'm going to do the same thing and mirror it on the right-hand side. You can see right here that I'm just taking my brush and just pulling it across and just creating these very simple notches. And I'm going to do it on the bottom as well, the exact same pattern. I'm going to change colors now, so I'm going to wipe the excess paint off my brush onto this paper towel and then rinse it in my water before grabbing some red paint, which I've mixed together with a little bit of white to make sure that my consistency and my opacity is exactly like how I want it to be. And then I'm just going to fill in this um, blobby shape that we created together and just completely fill it in with a flat layer of color. So you're welcome to add uh, some gradations or some variations between red and another color if you like, but I'm just going to keep this really simple and a flat layer of red. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I find it really relaxing to just paint um, it a just flat shade of color. It's kind of like being a kid again and painting in a coloring book. Um, so let's add some of the red to the smaller bloom on the left of the open flower. And I'm just going to fill in again this almond shape with my paint. And at this point, we're going to wait for this to dry before we proceed any further. In the meantime, we'll start working on our next flower, which will be a peony. To start off, we'll create three stems. So I'm going to make them intersect just like this. And at the top of the middle stem, I'm going to create a large oval shape, which will be the foundation for our peony. On either side of that oval, we'll create two smaller ovals, so small and medium, and those are gonna be peonies that are at different stages of the blooming process. Starting from the largest oval shape, we'll create a succession of U-shapes starting from the bottom. So just follow along and see how I'm creating these U-shapes that kind of connect one to the other on the bottom of that oval. The top, however, will be a little bit different where we create these frilly M-shapes that connect to one another. I'm gonna repeat the same process with the flower to the left, which is the medium-sized flower. And now that I've blocked off my flowers in the main composition, I'm gonna add little offshoots uh, from the stems, which is where my leaves are gonna be. And you can improvise based on where the negative space is in between your flowers. And so wherever you see a little hole or pocket where there isn't anything going on, you can add a little offshoot for a leaf right there. Let's paint the leaves. So I'm gonna add some yellow to my palette because I wanna add a little bit more um, variance with the greens and the tones of greens that I'm gonna be using. I'm adding some yellow to my palette, which I will mix with the green that I already have on the palette. I'm going with a yellowy kind of sap green, which you often find on peonies. Uh, and I'm adding a little bit of white to my mixture as well, since like I mentioned, I always add white to improve the texture and the opacity of my paints. I will quite frequently test my color on a piece of paper that I have on hand before actually using it on my piece. And that's because gouache is notorious for drying a little bit darker or changing a little bit from when it's, um, when it's still wet. It's a good practice to get into just to make sure that um, there are no surprises along the way and that you can anticipate what the color will look like when it's dry. So I'm painting the stems right here, and I'm not quite sure if the camera can pick up the difference between the greens, but uh, the poppy green is a little bit bluer, whereas the peonies will be a little bit greener in color. Let's work on the leaves first before we get into the blooms. Just like for the poppy, I'm playing around with the negative space between each of the flowers to determine exactly where the leaves are gonna be positioned. So if it makes you nervous having to freehand it, just sketch it out with a pencil first. 
Let me grab a piece of paper so I can show you exactly what the brush strokes will be like for the leaves. We're gonna lead with the tip of the brush and then press down the belly of the brush and then release. And we're gonna do that several times, starting from the tip of that first stem. And of course I messed up the first one, so let's fix that right there. And then we're gonna do one to the left. So tip of the brush, belly down, and then release. And that creates a really elegant kind of sinewy shape that works really well with the peony leaves. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, perfection is something that I think is overrated and it also causes a huge amount of stress. So don't stress about it. Think of this as a way to exercise your creativity and experiment while having fun. We're moving along with these uh, leaf shapes. I'm just continuing the same pattern over and over again on each of the three stems that I created. And when we're done with this, we can move on to painting the flower portion of the peony. Let's mix some pink for this flower. And I'm gonna start with some white and add in a little bit of the red that we used for the poppy. Uh, the ratio is mostly white with just a touch of the pink. And I'm gonna fill in this bloom exactly like what I did for the poppy. So it's flat and I'm not adding any variances or gradations of color to this at all. It's just completely flat and very graphic, which is a style I really love. When I was mixing this pink, I was very careful to make sure that the pink was a little bit lighter on my palette than what I actually wanted my outcome to be. And that's because I know, especially with paler colors, that the gouache will dry a little bit darker than what I expect. So um, just keep that in mind and, and do that little test sheet that I mentioned and you should be fine. Now that we're waiting for our peony to dry, we're gonna go back to our poppy for a little bit and do some of the detail work. And in this video, you'll see that we'll be bouncing around between flowers as we're waiting for our layers to dry. Next up, I'm gonna pick up my black and I'm gonna squeeze that onto my palette. And the black is gonna be for some of the detailing in the middle of the flower. And I'm not gonna call it shading because I think it's a much more graphic interpretation of the center of a poppy. I'm adding a little dot in the middle of the flower and that's just to help me remember exactly where the center of this flower is. And from here, I'm gonna create these little wavy lines that radiate outwards. And so I like to think of each of these bumps as being a petal on this flower, uh, albeit a very um, abstract one, but it helps because I usually do about two to three of these wavy lines per bump. We're definitely not being scientific here, and I might just get some angry emails from florists or professional botanists, but the point here is to have a creative interpretation of these flowers and not get so hung up on being like a photograph or completely accurate about it, because you can still have some amazing results and create beautiful decorative paintings which are so interesting and unique. Let's bounce back to the peonies again, and we're gonna create the petals on the peony. And I'm gonna start with a large upside down U and two identical ones uh, to the left and right of it. Just follow along with me and make sure that you connect them to each other. So right now I'm just creating a little connecting piece and I'm gonna replicate that on the right hand side as well. Then I'm gonna add a little petal that peeks between the two uh, petals to the right that I just created. And believe it or not, that's gonna be it for the large flower. And we're gonna repeat that same pattern for the medium sized flower, which is on my left. You could take artistic liberties here for how many petals you wanna include. I mixed a slightly darker value of the pink that I created for the peony. And I'm just going to paint over my pencil markings I'm adding a little bit of a curve on the bottom of my flower because I think it makes the petals look a little bit more layered one on top of the other. Other than that though, I'm just tracing on top of the pencil markings that we just made. We're gonna add some light brush strokes that originate at the top of every petal. So unlike the poppy where all the brush strokes originate from the center of the flower, these will originate from the ends, so the tip of every petal. And we're just gonna create curves wherever the petal looks like it's curving, so those are usually on the sides. And you just add them to every single petal. You add them to the top of the flower as well. And there you don't even have to add any outlines, just those brush strokes will help define the edge of that flower. Now let's repeat this on the other two blooms. I'm also gonna add some green details to the bottom of the flower. So where the stem connects with the peony, I'm gonna add these three little leaf-like shapes and that makes it look nice and finished. Come to think of it, I haven't done that for the poppy yet. So let's add that little detail to the poppy flower as well. 
Let's work on the center of the flower next. I'm gonna pick up my yellow ochre and mix it with some white to create this creamy, um, buttercream-like color. Let's go back to this piece of scratch paper right now and test out our brush strokes. We're gonna press down on the brush and release really quickly to create these little notches right here, as you can see. Now we're gonna use this brush stroke style and create a circle of these little notches um, around the center of the flower. Just follow along with me. I like to keep them longer on top and then shorten them on the bottom, which gives the flower a sense of dimension. Let's use the same color and the same technique of brush strokes, but make them a little bit longer and use that for the center of the peony. Unlike the poppy where we created a circle of these um, brush strokes, for the peony, they're all gonna be angled in the same direction. So I take my brush, place it where it needs to go, and then quickly snap it towards um, the direction of the stem. Let's work on flower number three, which will be a garden rose. I'm starting with a gentle curve with an oval on top of it and adding some leafy shapes on either side of the stem. I'm making those leafy shapes different in scale, so one of them is smaller and one of them is bigger, which makes it look a little bit more natural. I'm adding the stem first, which is the same thing that I did for the previous two flowers. And for this rose, I'm using a darker green than what I used for the peony. And I did that by mixing the same color as we had for the peony and just adding a little bit of black to it. I'm going to fill in the shape of this first leaf. And when that's done, I'm going to add these very light brush strokes to the edges to give the leaf this serrated edge, which is commonly seen on the leaves of garden roses. I'm doing both sides, but I'm not getting too hung up on making sure it's completely symmetrical. Let's repeat the same thing for the other leaf. A good tip for this style of painting is to make sure that you mix enough paint to cover all of the areas that you'll be working on. And it might seem obvious, but if you run out of paint in a specific color you were working on and you need to remix it later, it can be a bit tricky to get a perfect match. So I think it's safer to plan ahead and sometimes mix a little bit more color than you actually need to make sure that you have enough and that it is consistent. For the flower on this garden rose, I mixed some yellow ochre with my red and my white, and this creates this uh, peachy pink color, which I think looks really nice for this flower. We're gonna fill it all in, and once that's done, I might just add a couple of irregularities to the edges so that the flower looks a little bit more natural and less like a lollipop. When you're working with gouache, because the paint itself is water soluble, you could encounter moments where the underlying layer, like for example, this green of the stem, will reactivate your paint. Going back to this test sheet again, you can see how if I take some wet paint and continue to work my brush over a dried layer, it will eventually blend those two colors together. So what do we do if that happens? First of all, don't panic. Clean your brush and wait for that layer to dry. Once it's dried, you can grab some more of your original color and just paint over it, simple as that. So let's wait for that to dry, like I mentioned, and work some little details to the leaves of our peony. I'm mixing a slightly yellower green while adding a bit of white as well to make sure that this color really stands out when I paint it over my darker color. So right here, I'm gonna take my brush and I'm going to paint a very thin line in the middle of each leaf. You can make it even, you can make it thick or thin, whatever your heart desires. I'm gonna do something similar for my rose leaves, except I'm gonna use a darker green and add some veining to the leaves as well. To do this, you start with the middle of the flower and add some brush strokes that angle outwards. Let's do this for both leaves. Now for the center of the garden rose, I recommend, just like for the peony, starting with a pencil sketch for the petals first, just to get your bearings. We start in the middle of the circle and we will create some very small uh, upside down U's that layer one on top of the other. You want them to be smaller and tighter, closer to the middle, and larger and more spread out as you get to the bottom of your rose. Above the midway point, you're welcome to add as many layers as you like to help make your rose look very lush and full. Once you get more comfortable, you could eventually just freehand this portion without having to do your pencil lines first. Let's mix a darker pink, which is a combination of the pink I used for the flower and a little bit of black to darken it a bit. We're gonna trace over all of our pencil markings, 
And you can use your number two brush, or if you have something smaller, that would work great as well. I'm gonna finish this up and just trace all of my lines. And when I'm done with that, I'm gonna add some little notches in the bottom of every petal. And this is gonna be some simple shading to give the flower a little bit more dimension. All of these lines will be closer to the bottom of every petal. So that's a good rule of thumb to remember where they're supposed to go. You can do a lot of them on the larger petals and just a couple on the smaller ones. I'm gonna add a couple of extra petals along the bottom of this rose to make it look a little bit more natural and to make it look a little more open as well. You don't have to add this part, this is at the artist's discretion, so if you're happy with how your rose looked like before this edition, just keep it the way it was before. We're gonna jump onto our next flower, which is going to be a daisy. So I'm gonna do a S-shaped uh, curve for the stem and then another two curves that will meet the original middle stem at the very bottom. At the top of those three curves, we're gonna add these flat oval shapes, which will be for our flowers. And let's add some extra curves for some leaves too. I'm jazzing things up a little bit by adding some details here for roots on the flower. And this part is optional if you just wanna keep your daisies simple. Again, I'm starting with the stem first, and I'm mixing a blue-green that leans slightly more blue. Let's start at the top and work our way down in as smooth of a line as we can manage. And it doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, um, irregularities are good because it looks more natural that way anyway. So relax, enjoy the process, and um, experiment as you go. As you can see now, my brush strokes have gotten a little bit wider, and that's because I'm doing the leaves for my daisies. And so for this, we're gonna be using the same technique as we used for the peonies, where we go from light pressure to heavy pressure on the brush to create this thin to thick effect. We're gonna work on the roots next and create another thick to thin, but this time with very undulating um, wavy lines to make it look like roots on a, on a flower. And I always find roots very therapeutic to draw because there's something really mindless and kind of doodle-like about the process of painting them. Let's mix a brownish yellow for the middle of our flowers. And I'm not going with a primary yellow because I want the color to be a little bit more natural. So I've mixed together my yellow ochre with my white and added just a touch of yellow to brighten it a little. Let's move on to the sketch of our next flower while we're waiting for this to dry. And our next flower is going to be bluebells. I've drawn a curve for our stem and I'm adding some oval shapes at the top and I'm going to block off where my flowers are going to be on either side before I develop the details of every flower. So just follow along. The position of your flowers don't have to be in the exact same spots as mine. Just distribute them somewhat evenly and remember that they go from small at the top to gradually larger as you move down the stem. Once you have all your oval shapes and you're happy with them, you can start creating the petals on the edges of every oval. So the petals will only be on the sides that are not facing the stem, and you're basically creating these W-like shapes. You can give them some variations to make them look a little bit more natural, and I think it makes the piece look a lot more interesting if they're not all completely uniform. Now that we have our flowers in the right positions, we can add some leaves wherever there is some negative space that we need to fill. So evaluate your piece and see where you notice holes or areas that you can fill with uh, shapes for leaves. And don't worry if your leaves are overlapping your flowers in your sketch because as we know with gouache, the paint will completely cover any layers underneath. I'm painting the center stem of my flower and allowing the stem to get gradually thicker as I move towards the bottom. And that's because this plant or this flower is very different from all the other ones we created. As you'll notice, all of the flowers on this one come from the central stem, which looks more like a branch than all the other stems we created. But aside from that, the rest of it we tackle just the same as we did before with the stem first. I'm mixing a blue and white together uh, to create this beautiful sky blue, which I will use for the bluebells. I wouldn't say that there's a specific technique or method to use for painting your bluebells. If you want to outline it and then color it in or just color it in as you go, whichever way works best for you and that you prefer. 
let's not forget our little buds at the top. And for those, I'm actually not gonna do those W-like shapes because these are gonna be for flowers that have not yet bloomed. So we're gonna keep them oval and maybe give them a little bit of a sharper tip on the ends and leave them as is. Next up, we're gonna start painting our leaves and you can alternate between these narrower type leafy shapes and the traditional sort of almonds that come to a point. And just like with the flowers, the leaves are gonna be smaller along the top of the stem and gradually get larger along the bottom. We can also add some brush strokes that connect the flowers to the smaller stems. So that's what I'm doing right now. Now let's fill in these large leaves along the bottom. And as you can see, my paint is looking a little bit watery, so I wanna make sure that I'm picking up enough paint in order to make that creamy consistency I mentioned at the beginning. So as you can see, this is a much better consistency and it really flows so well and makes the job a lot easier. I'm gonna add some texture to the edges of these leaves, just like I did for the rose, and we're gonna use that same technique. I think it gives it some nice character and a little more texture too. Let's work on the center of our bluebells next. I'm mixing my white with my yellow ochre and a little bit of black. And when you're preparing this color for the center of the bluebell, you wanna make sure that this color is a different value, meaning it's a different darkness from uh, the blue that we used for the flower. So either make it lighter or make it darker so that way it doesn't disappear and blend in with the background. All we're doing for the center of these bluebells are three or four little dots. It's the simplicity of this that I absolutely love, and it makes it really decorative. Um, so you could even use these flowers as starting points to create patterns and things like that. I'm mixing a darker green to add some veining to our leaves. And let's jazz things up a little bit and change our brush stroke style for these leaves. We're gonna start at the base of each leaf and create several lines that point towards the tip of each leaf. And feel free to use your own artistic interpretation or even change up the brush stroke style if something else speaks to you. And then we have one final detail to add before these bluebells are finished, and that is a detail in the middle of each flower. So I'm mixing a slightly darker blue. Then I'm going to create what looks basically like an uppercase cursive M in the middle of each flower. And you want the peaks of your M's to be facing towards the stem on every flower. You can add some variations here too as well, either having one peak, two peaks, or three if you have enough room for it. Let's add a little bit of shading to the buds as well as the underside of every M. So that'll give it that feeling of depth like the bluebell is forming a cup-like shape. To finish it off, let's add a couple of more brush strokes on the tip of every petal, and that'll give it this beautiful sense of texture. We're nearly done with this tutorial, and if you're still watching, give yourself a little pat on the back. You're doing great. The last thing that we're gonna add before we wrap this all up are the petals on our daisy, and you can add some pencil marks to help guide you. I've mixed an off-white using white, black, and yellow ochre, and I'm putting pressure at the very beginning here and gradually releasing the brush as I get closer to the center of the flower. I like having the petals curve a little bit downwards and I make the top petals a bit shorter to make the flower look more three-dimensional. Let's repeat this for all of our daisies. I just love how whimsical and graphic these look. And once you get a hang of the technique and how you do it, it's actually really easy and quick. If you switch up the colors to make the petals yellow and the centers a dark brown, you end up with some black-eyed Susans, which is another flower you can keep in your repertoire. Now let's add those last little petals and fill in that negative space, and we're done. Just don't forget to erase all of your pencil markings to get that nice finished look. So hopefully this video was helpful and that you had some fun and um, were able to play around with a medium that perhaps you haven't worked with in this way before. And if you have any questions about what we did today, please leave them in the comments below. If you have any video requests, please let me know as well, because I would love to learn what it is you're interested in learning about. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.